Good morning, everyone. Today is April 28th, 2018, and this is the John Chappelle Natural Philosophy Society Saturday Science Chat. And uh, you can find us at naturalphilosophy.org, uh, where you can join us um, and be a member and participate in our forums, or um, you can also find us on Facebook, and uh, you can also uh, participate in conferences like this, and also we have our our worldwide uh, conference coming up June 27th to the 30th this year, 2018, at the campus of the University of Connecticut. So uh, I've decided to go myself. So uh, I will be there, and uh, so I was I. I was able to do so um, for around a thousand dollars ago. I mean, thousand dollars or so. So I'm flying in from Seattle all the way to Connecticut. So that's all. That's about as far as you can fly uh, in the United States. But uh, so, like, airline is about like five hundred bucks. Um, I did find that uh, when you do sign up for the economy dorms, it really is just sixty nine dollars for the whole room, so you can put three people in there for just $69 a night. So um, I've got a whole room to myself, so if someone uh, has a problem with uh, with money or something like that, you know, so I've, I, got two other sp I got two other spots in case anyone wants to go to the conference or something like that and, and they need a place to stay. Of course, you might have to you might have to listen to my theories a lot if, if you do that. But uh, that's going on, and I also found that uh, the University of Connecticut has a shuttle. And for let's see, I need to meet some people here. And for uh, sixty dollars each way, or one hundred twenty dollars round trip, uh, you can get a shuttle from the airport to the University of Connecticut. Um, straight to the Nathan Hale Inn. So you don't have to rent a car. Um, you can stay relatively cheaply at the inn. And uh, I believe registration is like $200 for non-speakers and $150 for speakers. And uh, they are now taking um, um, the, the uh, papers for inclusion in their proceedings. And uh, when you do that, um, they charge a $15 per page inclusion fee. But uh, I will be there. So I hope to see some other people there as well. I see we have Bill here to today. How are you doing, Bill? I was wondering, Bill, are you going to the CNPS conference uh, this year? Um, I think so. I haven't. Uh made all the arrangements yet but uh still working on it now you're right you're right there in connecticut aren't you where, is that where you live no I, i'm in uh near washington dc washington dc okay but pretty close <laughs> it's a, a a long one day trip to get there <laughs> yeah yeah not quite as far as flying from seattle i suppose but <laughs> not that far <laughs> But I've made all my arrangement. I've got all my tickets. I've got my room reserved. Sent in my registration. So I am most certainly going. Okay, so. Well, let's get the discussion started here today. So um, we got a new guy here, Giraffe Science. And today's an open forum. and. Uh, he wanted to discuss about unification. So what do we want to discuss about unification? Do you want to try and uh, kick us off? Yeah, um, well, I would say there's lots of evidence that all the forces are connected in the sense that they all obey the inverse square law, generally speaking, to all the speed of light. So magnetism and uh, gravity especially, but they also found in the strong nuclear forces 
Do you think the strong nuclear forces are related? Because that, that seems to be like the weirdest. Yeah, it still has a time force. limit to it. You know, it still it still doesn't. It's still not an instantaneous force. And I just I just brought I just included it just because forces. But I would say that. Now we've been having some uh, pretty heated discussions over the speed of gravity. Uh, well, yeah, I mean, it's a little hard to detect it, absolutely, but clearly the mathematics, you could kind of reverse engineer it and say that that must be right because it's in the math and the math is correct. So, you know, it's a perverted way of proving it, but it sort of can't, guess can't be that far off. And who cares whether it's a few hundred million miles off? You know what I'm saying? It's such a, but I'm just saying that, all right, just for the sake of argument, let's accept that all the forces have a very similar. I would argue that that's a reason to believe that all the forces are made of the same. Thing. Other the other explanation for magnetism they offer conventional physics is. I think you're cutting out on us a little bit there. Can you make sure to uh, speak into your microphone clearly. Yeah. I think I am, but okay. Yes. Can you hear me now? Yeah, we can hear you now, but you seem to have dropped out. Maybe your internet connection is flaking out on you. Um, yeah, I don't know whether it could be the mic. I mean, you know, everything could be happy. Something could be wrong. I can't hear any, you know, I don't get anything back from the computers. So can you hear me now? Okay. Yeah, I can hear you now. Okay. It's just like you were randomly dropping out. Okay. Um, the volume is a little low as well. If you could maybe speak up a little, please. All right. Well, let me let me just I'll, I'll try real quick just replugging my mic in. Okay. Hopefully he gets his mic plugged back in. <laughs> but there, there there is this controversy going now because like. Uh, uh, one of the former dissidents, Dan Flanderen, claims that gravity uh, must travel instantaneously since orbital mechanics uh, requires it. And I think uh, mainstream would probably agree with that assessment that orbital mechanics requires gravity to act instantaneously. So there's this argument that since it takes like eight minutes for the light to go from the sun to the earth that by the time we see it uh the position of the sun has changed now personally i don't buy that because the position of the sun didn't change right it's the earth that's orbiting the sun so the any observational effect we see here on earth does not change the mechanical location of the sun and where it's being gravitated to, right? So this is a, sym a symmetry argument that uh, by the time the gravity waves, the the, or the field, the gravity field reaches the Earth, um, it's a hundred percent spherically symmetric, and it's set up that there isn't actually a wave of anything traveling from the sun to the Earth that takes like eight minutes. Well, do you believe, can you hear me now? Yeah, we can hear you now, but you sound about the same. So just try and speak closer to your mic or something, I suppose. Yeah, is this any better? No, it's about the same, but we can still hear you. <laughs> yeah, all right, well, it's, yes, it's, it's what it is, I guess. Yep, it's um, what it is. I'll, I'll try to be as clear as possible then. Um, yeah, I don't think there's any um, waves, but I, I would, I guess I'm, I'm not arguing for a particle theory. Um, I think that all the forces behave in kind of a ray manner. That is, you know, they hit a, a very small, discrete, straight line force. And like light would be in the same category. So essentially, you could, I would argue that the whole electromagnetic spectrum <laughs> is a form of gravity in the sense that gravity just doesn't come at a frequency. So if you take the elemental bits out of the idea of a photon would be two discrete little bits at a that there a force would be something that doesn't have a frequency. Magnetism is as 
these things that not at a frequency, but that they're polarized and that they have two dis two um, um, kinds. You know, so you have a plus kind and a minus kind. I call it electron force and proton force. Anyway, I have a whole theory of it on the on website, but um, you know, I just think that you can come up with really um, mechanical solutions to all of these problems that they suggest you have to have interference. And I, I guess I'm just saying that I think there is a lot of evidence tying because of more speed of these forces it makes a lot more sense to try to combine something like gravity and magnetism and recognize that the two theories, quantum mechanics and relativity are both wrong. There's the truth is something in between the two, or something, <laughs> you know. Or either that we've got it so completely, totally wrong, and that's why a dissident uh, scientists exist to one day show. Oh, and all that stuff was wrong. <clears throat> well, I think you know they that's their obligation is to fill the void that you know of of having some sort of factual physics. But my, my only concern is an awful lot of dissidents are. I'm just regurgitating, you know, old, other archaic religion. <laughs> it's not like they're, I don't think they're answering the questions with modern science. They're old wrong answers and saying Catholic. Now you were cutting out a little bit out there, out there but did you say you had a website? Uh, yeah, uh, draftphysics.com. DraftPhysics.com. Well, let's see if I can go. And I have a YouTube channel. It's Draft Science. All right. Well, I let's see what is going wrong with my system here. May I just say a word while you're looking at that website, Franklin, um, about uh -huh. the speed of gravity? Um, you said I think that the mainstream considers it to be infinite. <clears throat> now that certainly was the case with Newton, uh, uh, but I don't think it is the case with with modern conventional physics. I think actually they all say it travels the speed of light. Yeah, well, it's in Einstein's uh, equation. So obviously he established that the gravity moves the speed of light. That was yes. his fix to even Mercury's you know orbital problems was recognizing that the the force is essentially induct Yes. <clears throat> so I, I think Wikipedia, if you look up Wikipedia for example, they give some sort of mainstream arguments uh, as to why this aberration effect that you referred to in the case of light is not observed in the case of gravity. So to me, this is a bit of explaining away because I actually make a distinction between the speed of a gravitational wave where you could have a gravitational um, action which could uh, give rise to some compression in the ether, if you like. That would actually travel at the speed of light because it would be like an electromagnetic wave. That and the speed of gravitational interaction. Now, the latter, I think, I wouldn't say it's infinite, but I think it's sort of like, uh, you know, billions and billions of times the speed of light. That that would be my own analysis of it. I'll make a distinction there. I just don't think you can have anything in the universe move faster than the speed of light. Um, all kinds of paradoxes. Well, that's certainly the conventional view. Um, yeah, well, I, think I, I wouldn't accept that myself. I, I think the <laughs> we, we can discuss that. that. So you think there's going to be faster than light communication someday? Yes. Well, I, 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 I'm actually very unorthodox in these matters. Um, one thing which I spoke about maybe, and I, hint, I mentioned it in passing two weeks ago in the presentation, was that um, in my analysis, the speed of interaction of electric current through a hardwired circuit travels at maybe 100 or 200 times the speed of light. Yeah, so there's just one simple example every day. I don't see where you have evidence for that. I mean, I would argue that force travels through the circuit at the speed of light at best, but I don't, where do you have evidence that they've ever had a circuit where they've ever had anything, an actual change yeah. in a function faster than the speed of light. I just don't think. Well, I, I, get, I gave some um, references to experiments, uh, both 
some time ago and also recently, you know, in the 1980s, uh, say in Wireless World, quite quite a, a series of experiments done by this gentleman by the name of Milnes, M-I-L-N-E-S, where he made up these frames of, of um, wire going around, you know, thousands of times going around frames. And he he uh, used a, a tall building, actually, like a skyscraper as, as a frame, and he wound the wire around it, and he did a lot of experiments. And he found that the... Um, the signals actually seem to traverse the, the long cable at uh, maybe hundreds of times the speed of, of light. Yeah, well, see, the problem with those, I, I could, I, I'm surmising what the experiment is. I mean, obviously, the, the, that creates induction with magnetic. You know what I'm saying? If you have the coils anywhere near each other, they end up inducing current in each other at the speed <clears> of light. So obviously, they are jumping ahead because they're inducing magnetic uh you know yeah i see th this demonstrates a principle which i think we, we were quite aware of that uh with all of us my, myself included um it really depends where you're starting from and i mean if you start from the premise as you do that nothing can travel faster than the speed of light well then you try to explain these experiments in terms of your own theory, if you like. Now, you, you could say the same about me. I'm not going to deny that. But this is the problem. Um, now, I, I, philosophically, I don't see any reason why <clears throat> uh, the speed of an electromagnetic wave in, uh, in the ether should be a speed limit, any more than I, I consider the speed of sound in air, Mach 1, to be a speed limit. I, I think it's, it's just related to the local properties of, well, of, I, I just, yeah, I'm not a medium believer in, so I don't think there's any space. Yeah, so, so we're, we're back to the, to the fundamental problem. You're starting from a different base from the one I'm starting from. Right. And perhaps we're both trying to explain experimental results in terms of our own theories, right, right, right. whereas we should be, we ought to be doing the other, the, the other way around. We ought to be dismissing everything from our minds. You, uh, as to whether you think the speed, of light as a speed limit, and I should be dismissing from my mind whether I think superluminal uh, speeds are feasible. And then we should just look at the experiments totally objectively. It, it's very, very hard to do that because we both have preconceived ideas. Well, I think every experiment, as I have found out, is, is fundamentally flawed in that it's always been pre-interpreted. So you can go all the way back to the Young experiment and saying that, oh, they discovered interference then. But uh, as is clearly the evidence, Newton discovered it in, in this small aperture experiments. He already discovered interference patterns. He just didn't call them that. And, you know, in Newton's rings. And so you see that, you know, it, it's all a subject to people's assumptions going in. I mean, I, I've pointed out how interferometers can't even work. The, the, the Michelson-Morley experiment, for example, is fundamentally flawed in the sense that I found a, a single, a plain piece of glass splits light 50-50 at a 45 degree angle. So why would I put mirror on the glass? How could the mirror, the 50-50 mirror on the glass improve a plain piece of glass? How does it make it do 50-50 better? A plain piece of glass does 50-50. So I'm saying that these experiments are so fundamentally flawed that I'm saying that even looking at experiments, you have to look at them in detail and you have to demand that there be consistency, assumptions, and the conclusions. And what I'm arguing is, is they're connecting the dots, they're cheating, often cheating with their own math. They don't even put the slit width in their double slit math. In the width of the slit, a fundamental variable, and it's not even in double slit math. But I, I, I wouldn't wish to be too pessimistic. I mean, um, otherwise one could just wring one's hands and say there's no point in doing any experiments because people have their own prejudices and they'll interpret, <laughs> we interpret the experiments in terms oh, yeah, of no, those. No, I'm not against you it. can't prove anything. I, I'm not against experiments at all. I'm just saying it's you can never use them as a generic because every time somebody cites an experiment to me, I'm saying I can find the flaw in their interpretation. I'll find their Copenhagen. I'll find their Huygens. I'll find their Heisenberg principle. I'll find some, some assumption that went into their interpretation of the experiment, and I'll demonstrate that the experiment doesn't prove what they think it proves because there's a fundamental flaw in their assumptions.
Yeah, I was also referring to my own uh, slight pessimism about, you know, people having preconceived notions. Um, I, I would use certain principles in maybe interpreting experimental results, and one would be Occam's razor. N not um, infallible, but, you know, uh, if we uh, have to introduce more hypotheses and assumptions in explaining the results, I would then be very cautious. You know, I, I, I'd start... Um, uh, questioning okay, well, the, the analysis. Can I apply that theory to your to yourself? Let me just say to you, um, wouldn't you think that if you, if you create an ether, that the ether would itself have to be made of something, and therefore wouldn't it be simpler just to get to the something the ether is made of instead of talking about the ether? Because I would argue that you know you're kind of just saying that the the mechanics of this ether is it can carry something in straight line carries force in linearly without spreading, unlike all other all other mediums spread force because they're under so is your ether made of sand or is it made of like jello? But it doesn't have to be made of some kind of mechanism. Yeah, okay. what do you think well, it's made out of? Yeah, th those are questions which I, I think we, we may even be discussing again, we have discussed in the past, and I'm actually very hesitant to get into that. Um, I mean, we can argue about words. Ether is actually a dirty word in terms of modern uh, mainstream science now. In fact, one professor admitted privately to a colleague of mine uh, that um, he actually believed in the ether, but he, it was as much as his career was worth to admit that. So he was keeping it secret. But I mean, it's almost like God or the universe or pantheism. You could say God is everything or is God a, 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 a necessary word? Just call it the universe. Is ether a necessary word? All I'm saying is we, we talk about a, a piece of matter because we we say, well, this has mass or it has density or it has elasticity. And therefore, we call it a piece of iron, for example. Well, I find that what we conventionally talk about as free space has properties. It has a, a characteristic impedance. It has a, 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 a permittivity, electric permittivity. It has a magnetic permeability. So it, it, it's a substance, if you like. It's not nothing. Call it the ether. Call, call it X, if you like. Call, call it, if you want to call it free space, you can, but I think that's a bit um, misleading. Yeah, you know, I'm more of a something and nothing person. So I'm saying there's a ton of something. See, there's nothing in the universe. There's places where there's nothing, pure empty space. And then there's places where there's force, which would be these little bits of, of, of stuff moving the speed of light. And that's essentially like if, you, if to, to turn it into an ether, it'd be like an ether that is granular, little grains of sand and light. And so everything is in this field of high pressurized sand that way. And that, that, that scenario creates essentially mock gravity, which is you know, a, a particle gravity theory that works quite well. And it also works if you just polarize that sand, if you just turn it into two bits, and it, just like electron proton, and you have electron force. And also very well explain magnetism. So it's like an ether in the sense that I'm saying there's a something that's very dense that is a small force. Is a, is a manifest. Whereas my view would probably tend to be nearer the 19th century view that ether is an all pervasive substance. It's not maybe located in only certain places, yeah, yeah, certain yeah, parts things, of space. I'm, I'm just making it granular. So instead of making it a solid thing that transmits stuff, I'm making it a, a field of energy and that the can transmit energy through that energy field. But, but you think that it doesn't exist everywhere, that it's only in certain areas? Am I, think I getting it right there? Two things. I think there's force bits. So I call them force bits. So let's say there's the smallest thing in the universe, photon, or the virtual magnetism, or a graviton. And then there's matter bits, electrons and protons. Force bits get trapped between, you know, Proportionally between the electrons and the all of the the electron force always bounces back and forth between electrons, and that means force because they bounce at a faster rate. So they're like little ping balls bouncing between tennis balls. Likewise, the proton has its own force that bounces between electron force hits a proton, it leaves per 
just having those simple rules where the opposite force, the, the, the electron force is perpendicularly excreted by the proton, the proton force is perpendicularly excreted by the electron, so therefore all the pressure can be pressure, there's no pressure between electrons and protons, and then I'm just saying I can make a force dynamic that creates all kinds of pressure mediation. Um, now, can you guys see what I'm sharing? I think I'm sharing uh, your website here. Yeah, it looks like it. <laughs> Thanks. And I, I think I've found like the picture of what you were just describing here. Exactly. between. It's, it's perfect timing, really. Just excellent. So, so I, I can explain why, you know, you can create high energy photons in the sense. Look at that example. The big things are the electron things and the little force. So at a certain distance. You would have a high, a low frequency light, like red light, when they're far apart. When you bring them close together, you could end up with something like bouncing rate is increased. Always be at a harmonic and resonance. So the electromagnetic spectrum is essentially being created by the force between electrons. Well, I'm not sure I understand where you get the. Uh... I mean, the, the tricky thing about charges is that similar charges repel, but opposite charges right. so attract. Right. Go down a little further. Go down a little further on the page, and you'll see where the opposite charges are are demonstrated. <laughs> so there, here you have an electron and a proton here. So what's going on? Right. So all of this. So there's two kinds of forces, right? I'm I'm just saying that there's. I mean, I've just red and black just to illustrate electron force and little black and red things moving the speed of light in the in the cosmic background radiation so it's a, it's sir it's opposing force on everything so in the circumstance electron and proton the red force is going to bounce off of the proton and the black force is going to leave perpendicular any force that's trapped between an electron and a proton, you'll see that the red force will leave through the electron and the black force will leave through the proton, creating a very low pressure between the two. And that's why they're very attracted to each other is because there's no force bouncing between them. Those were a proton and a proton in that example, force between them that would be trapped. And as you move them closer together, that force would have more and more impact protons creating a higher pressure. it's a perfect way of of duplicating the circumstance charge it, it, it's an excellent charge so let's see so what exactly are these arrows so are these the particles of your ether coming yeah, in they're, they're, they're not ether like i said they're i don't call them that but obviously they're yes they're little bits moving the speed of light gravitons magnetons are you can think of them as photons and so you've got two different kinds. So all of, so are the like the red arrows coming out of the protons and uh, they're not. I, as I say, there it's the field energy. So it, they're already in space, like cosmic background radiation. So there's a ton of this red and black stuff moving the speed of light that always exists. In space. So fundamentally, you have two kinds of things. Right, electrons and, and, and protons are the two matter bits. And electron force and proton force would be the two force bits. And that's the four elements that make up the. And it, you're showing here that like the the proton forces are being reflected by the electron. Is that what you're doing? Uh, well, well, I'm saying, yeah, well, the illustration sort of just if you think of the black stuff as electron sensitive and the red stuff is proton sensitive. The black stuff reflects off of an electron, red stuff reflects off of a proton. Okay, and then the opposite happens when the go down further to the magnet example. You can here's a magnet. Force goes into a magnet, it becomes in mixed red and black. And what a magnet is essentially doing is filtering it. So all the red force goes out one end of the magnet, all the black force goes out the other end of the magnet. So this is so the electron and proton are essentially the the magnetic monopole. 
uh, uh, well, how do you explain the that you know uh, a stationary electron charge feels no force in a magnetic field? And it would seem that if you've got all this, I, I don't think uh, that's true at all. I think it it feels plenty of force in a magnetic field. I, I that I think that's why they use magnets to move electrons. No, no, see that that's the that's one of the hardest things to describe, and it's absolutely true that if I put an electron, a stationary electron charge. Well, you can only have a stationary charge if you've already charged the field around it. Electrons are never stationary unless you force them to be by creating a magnetic field around them that forces them to be stationary. Um, no, not really. It's like if you have like any piece well, of well, wire, actually any metal. Let use use my example of uh, a simple, uh, you know, CRT. Okay, uh, you know, a TV. You have to force the electrons through a voltage to move, and the only way you deflect the electrons is through a magnetic field. Clearly, they're highly sensitive to magnetism. Yes, they are highly sensitive to magnetism, but they must be moving. See, the point being that the field itself cannot exert any force if the electron itself is not moving. That's why if you take uh, a copper wire, and I while you're think... moving that in the magnetic field, that generates an EMF. But yeah, it, yeah, as soon as you I, stop I the wire, then there's no EMF. No, but that's, we're not talking about, you don't need the electron to move to um, for the electron to be sensitive to magnetism. So I'm just saying- that No, I'm actually saying that's absolutely true. You do have to move the electron in order for it to be it. sensitive. I'm saying, I'm, you're saying it, I'm saying there's, I, if show me the, ex, give me the name of the experiment and I'll, I'll demonstrate the flaw in your, your uh, observation because there's no, absolutely no reason for electrons not to move. I have heard of no circumstance where they're- That's exactly- well, See, if, if that were true, then I should be able to generate See, the experiment is that you take your wire and you place it statically um, next to a magnet and the electrons ex experience no force, which... They do when you move it in. Yes, they do when you move it in, but my point is that if, if the... Uh, yeah, I would no, think balance the charge. Once the magnet stays in one position, then you've already balanced the charges. Franklin, if the wire is superconducting, it will carry it, a current will be induced and it will be maintained. So your analogy isn't really correct. You have to make the assumption that the wire is not superconducting. Well, I, I think even no, I'm not sure that that's particularly. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I what I'm talking about here, that. mainstream would just say that that's the Lorentz. I don't know Sports what you're part. talking about, Franklin. This is the Lorentz sure force you law. You don't know what you're talking about. I you're creating an happen. argument using an example that doesn't apply. Sorry. Well, look, my, my explanation to what you're bringing up as a situation is I'm saying that electrons will always find balance in their condition or they will move to a balanced condition. So clearly the electrons do move when you move the magnet in. If you don't move the magnet anymore, you just leave it where it is, Clearly, the electrons will stay in their new position. Which That's is, not correct. That's only correct oh, for a non-superconducting wire. That's okay. only correct for a non-superconducting wire. Well, I'd just like to finish with the point I made so I don't have to start over again. Well, you have if to get have your facts wire, straight. If I have a wire and I move a magnet into is it. Is it superconducting or not? No, no. I'm talking about a regular conventional wire circumstance. And we're not, I'm not talking about superconducting in the moment. And even superconducting re still requires alternating current. But I'm not going to argue with you. Please, can I just finish? If you move a magnet into a wire, you're changing the pressure of the electron. You're creating voltage by forcing electrons closer to each other to achieve a balanced condition. Once the magnet stops moving, the electron stops moving, but it still is in the position that you pushed it into. So it has a tiny voltage that is created in the conductor. The problem is, is that voltage will dissipate, okay, because it is a conductor. <laughs> Um, but the, the point is, is the pressure is created. It stays in that pressurized condition till you move the magnet again to change the voltage. So you do change the voltage. The okay, so how do you explain what happens in a superconducting wire where the current continues on even though the uh, wire is no longer moving? 
But well, I'm, I'm, you're, you're saying that you're still creating an electric flow of current um, through what process? Well, what you're process making the assumption that current is a flow of something. But anyway, in a superconductor, the uh, current remains uh, flowing, if you will, or there is a magnetic field induced, and that magnetic field is maintained whether or not the loop and the wire, the magnet and the wire are moving relative to each other or not. I thought the only thing superconductors allowed you to do was to maximize the amount of current. Therefore, you could put a lot of current through a wire and create a great deal of magnetism. Well, I, I think not... this whole discussion is really sort of off in the wrong direction because Franklin introduced this this hypothesis about electrons and wires, and he shouldn't have done that. He should have talked about free electrons. So let's just talk about free electrons in space and not talk about electrons and wires. Well, I know, but you'd have to believe there is such a thing as a free electron to believe to have a conversation about free electrons. I don't well, know. we know that we know that in uh, TV tubes and cathode ray tubes, we know the uh, um, phenomenon that are applied that work there in the case of where they fire electrons. Okay, you're familiar with the old fashioned TV tube, right? I just brought and it up. Not I just the modern it up. LCDs. I mean, that technology is well established and well known. And you think those are free electrons? Well, that's the. I mean, that's pushed, the, they're the theory pushed, of it. Yeah. They're being pushed by 50,000 volts. I mean, they're not exactly free electrons. They're clearly. Well, they're not in. They're in a vacuum. That's what that means. What does it mean? They're in a vacuum. Well, they're, everything's in a vacuum, technically. All electrons are in a vacuum. From their perspective. So anyway, the, my point wasn't that magnets strip electrons off of conductors, that they can actually pull the electrons off, because the electrons are obviously already attached to the conductor. There's not free. They're already semi-attached to the protons in the conductor. That's why the electrons are there in the first place, is because they like it where they are. So magnets don't have the power to pull electrons off of conductors. They can't tear a piece of metal to pieces really pressurize or depressurize. So here I brought up the uh, Britannica definition of the Lorentz force law. So anybody who's attempting to explain anything about magnetism would have to explain how this is derived. Or you'd have to show how this is actually experimentally wrong. But this is just an empirical result, really which is that the force experienced by the charge depends on the magnitude of the charge plus the uh, times the velocity times cross the uh, magnitude of the magnetic force. Again, but uh, I'm saying that that velocity component is totally irrelevant to the function of electrons in the real world. They don't, they don't have to have a velocity to have a charge. Uh, there's plenty of charges that are static i mean i could i can put a charge on a comb for example so you're saying if i put a charge on the comb it's a moving conductor or something there's a bunch of stuff moving inside the comb i would argue that no there's just a lot of electrons under pressure on the surface negatively or positively charged based on the fact of whether the electrons are on the surface well the the equation indicates that the velocity is important that it's not that it's a critical the part. Transferring and it, the velocity is only important when you're transferring magnetism into electricity or converting electricity into magnetism. That's where this is applicable, but it's not applicable in circumstances of, like I said, I mean, essentially, I believe that the electron and the proton are mo magnetic monopoles, that electricity is a byproduct phenomenon. It's not a fundamental force. Magnetism is the fundamental force. <laughs> So, uh, so magnetism would be, because we're always trying to figure out what of all these different forces we have, which one is the fundamental one? So you would claim that everything can be built out of magnetism? 
the I'm beer. That everything could be built out of the the little black and red bit. So everything could be built out of gravity. Essentially, gravity is the mixture of the force. Magnetism is the segregation of the force. So obviously, when you segregate anything, you purify it, and and the purified form is magnetism. So that is, I, like I said, I I, I don't want to just do my theory here on your show. But I, I had I have explained how this all works in many videos, and it modeled very well. It, it describes what you see in experiments very well. But you would still have to explain what exactly are your positive bits and what are your negative bits. Protons and electrons, they're just, they are the, what they are, okay? They're polarized. That is, they're either... Um, are they oriented in three-dimensional space at a different geometric let's go back so I see like uh, going into in the in the beginning here that you say that you call these things quantons it looks like is that right yeah well I call them force bits and matter bits now because people make fun of the word yes I would argue that the fund of their Fundamental element is a little bit moving the speed of light, and that there's two polarizations of it. That's all okay, so is. those are your those that's, are your postulates. That's the every, every theory. Every theory has to start with some kind of postulate. Those are the checkers on the checkerboard. Start with black and red checkers. Mm-hmm. So we've got your force particles and we've got your, you said matter particles, what you're saying? Yeah, I call them matter bits, but same thing, right? The two fundamental okay. ones would be electron and proton. And I would argue that the neutron is just an electron. And okay, but you yourself can't really describe what the force bit is made out of or what is, it doesn't have any relationship to like, you know, uh, anything else that we know about, like a quark or is it? I don't believe in any of those things, so I believe those are just manifestations of the same things. The elemental bit, the quantum ball is the smallest thing there is. It's just a there what you make it out of. You can make it out of jello or uh, bricks or shingles. <laughs> it's a sparkly unicorn fur. It doesn't matter. It moves the speed of light in a straight line. It does what the elements of a moves the speed of light in a direction until it hits an electron. But is there any experiment that we could possibly do to show the existence of these things? Well, unless you have an experiment that can show the existence of gravity or show the existence. Because that would be, if you're trying to convince anybody. I'm just saying I can't take a picture of a photon, right? The only way you prove the existence of a photon is by having hit an electron. So I can show you things hitting electrons, but I can't. I think that's a key thing to science in that usually we determine these things experimentally. And if you could propose an experiment that shows, like if you had a machine that specifically, I don't know, like filtered out one versus the other or something and make an some prediction proves, do you have a do you have an experiment that proves that photons are a wave in two fields the magnetic field and the electric field when a photon can't be moved by either one of those forces i'm i'm just saying i'm not requiring physics to prove you know i, I mean me disproving it's a wave is just as stupid as them trying to disprove it's a particle so i'm just saying that we both can't do that except for the evidence that exists and i'm saying my theories well, you need to make new evidence, actually. I mean, because uh, I don't think that's necessary at all. I think we have plenty of evidence of phenomenon. Well, it have I mean, either needs to, make, to explain. If you want me to make glasses that can see photons as they travel through space, I'm saying I could probably spend a zillion years in this universe, and I'll never be able to make such glasses. You're never going to see a photon moving from one place to another. You're never going to do it. Because there's nothing you can bounce off of it. There's no way you can ever see it. All you can do is interfere with it. You can't. You can't possibly, benignly observe a photon. It's impossible. Well, I I don't know. Some people with gamma ray experiments would say that yeah, we can most certainly observe a photon because it causes a blip in our 
in our detector. You mean you can very... see one moving? You can see one going from point A to point B. I don't think there's yeah, any we can see that. Uh, no, and there's no such. You cannot rub up against a, 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 any electromagnetic spectrum. So I would give me the experiment, and I'll prove it's a piece of crap because that can't happen. Well, I mean, that is. Uh, we have a guy, Roger Wright. He always brings this up that when you um, annihilate a positron electron, you get out two gamma rays, and they can precisely track where those two came from because they hit the walls of the detector. Well, where something came from isn't what we're arguing. We're arguing about seeing it as it actually travels through space. I can see a laser beam by seeing photons that bounce off of the dust and hit my eye. I'm not seeing the photons that are traveling. I'm seeing a, tro a photon that just left the field. I'm seeing one that's got deflected. So seeing, seeing byproducts isn't showing something. So again, and, and trails in cloud chambers, those aren't, that's not direct evidence of anything. And you're just seeing you're seeing the stuff that doesn't keep going straight. You're seeing the stuff that's being deflected. You're not seeing the stuff that's going. Michael, uh, can we talk about something else? I have a question for Ian. Hey, well, go ahead and ask Ian a question, question for me. Yeah, okay. Uh, about your talk that you gave, you you were talking about the aberration effect, as I recall. Um, we were talking about the Airy experiment. You mentioned the Airy experiment. We had a discussion about that. Um, you recall? I think what, I've I glanced through that. Yes. Glanced um, through your discussion. And I think you said something about um, you accepted the notion that there was some kind of a refraction effect. And I didn't really quite understand what you were talking about. Yes. B because I saw uh, afterwards reference to a paper. Um, forgot now. I think you disagreed with it, maybe, Harry. And as I say, I've only been glancing through it. And um, maybe one of the guys, Monday or somebody, I, I don't know who it was, referred to it, which seemed to be not a million miles away from my own ideas. But um, let me see. Without having the documentation in front of me, um, well, the claim was the claim was this guy. I think his name was um, Maxos or something. Yes, Max, um, something like that. Um, and some paper from the GSJ, and um, he claimed that uh, that the glass reversed the direction and canceled out the aberration effect in the airy experiment. And yeah. my question is: Is that what you? think or do you think something different i i know i i think that that is essentially the same as the point i i was making um i think he was making it in a different way but i i think it's it's related to, to my point i mean the way i look at it is that if you um if you take the conventional explanation um of the air experiment and, and and you you take the eddington idea of the rain falling down and uh, you have to tilt the umbrella in the direction in order to ensure that uh, it still hits the central cross wires of the telescope now so you're you're doing that in, in that's, air assuming, or that's assuming of course that the um that your instruments or whatever is moving through space in a direction perpendicular to or or it, it is it is actually but in fact just in passing um i am um, i say that this in itself proves that that is the case because if if um if the star were moving and the earth were stationary there'd be no aberration it's not simply reciprocal but anyway that, that was another point i was making so uh if you say well look fill the telescope with water so if that explanation applies the refractive index of water uh, is greater than one, and therefore it slows down, and you'd have to tilt the telescope in a, a, a more so. Okay, but you don't, I, I, you maintain it. Well, if you consider the, the, the uh, starlight which is coming down, and you've had to tilt the telescope forward, so there's an angle of, of um, incidence. Now, that is refracted. Uh, so in other words, it comes in, but it's actually bent this way. So the, the light is already bent sufficiently so that you don't need to tilt the telescope forward. If you follow what I'm saying. 
Well, I'm, I'm not really sure. That my, my objection is that the argument that this guy in his paper and that Tom Miles was trying to put forward uh, he was talking about a black box and a light beam, and he didn't take into account the physics of how a telescope works. And so I didn't think that explanation made any sense. I'm not really convinced. But the problem I have with this uh, argument is um, I'm not really convinced that the, that the assumption that um, the telescope is moving laterally um, perpendicular or different from the direction that the light is coming in, I'm not really sure that that assumption is really correct. So um, to do an experiment that tests that assumption, which might be incorrect, I don't really see once you've shown that the assumption is incorrect, then, you know, that sort of makes the, the, the thesis, in, you know, invalidated. And I think that's what the area experiment shows. See, we're, we're somewhat back to um, this business that we talked about earlier in connection with the point made by the previous speaker, uh, that it somewhat depends on your starting point, you know, your, your philosophical basis. <coughs> um, well, the assumption is that the uh, telescope is moving laterally, okay, from right to left in the diagram, and that the light is coming down from above, okay and that you vector sum the velocity of the telescope adds to the velocity of the light that's coming down and that vector addition causes a change in the direction of the light. That's basically the thesis. And I, I said that uh, that did fit uh, with all the um, uh, results and the, the only conflict was that um, where you did a, a sort of a Michelson-Morley experiment, and uh, that could be explained by uh, an ether entrainment effect, and yet the aberration ex explanation which you've just given um, would assume that there's a sort of a static ether. Well, I, I maintain that that is not so, because um, the, the original light, which actually comes from some other eth etheric uh, atmosphere, retains its original position irrespective of whatever ethers it then uh, descends into like for example the terrestrial ether because uh, if if you analyze it the 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 if the ether is effectively entrained with the moving body the uh, that effect uh, allied to the aberration <laughs> sorry allied that, that aberration effect allied to the or opposed to the refraction effect cancels out so that it appears that there was actually no new ether that it was entering, that it still retains its um, original uh, etheric properties. So in other words, if um, the uh, ether in proximity to the surface of the Earth was actually carried with it, that explains the MMX, but it actually paradoxically also explains aberration. And it, it actually also explains the airy experiment as well. Now, I haven't seen a proper, as probably you haven't, haven't I haven't seen a proper explanation in the mainstream of, of, all, of all this and the air experiment. They say one thing, which I am contesting. They say the theory of relativity just puts out the coordinates, sine and cos and so on. And it says that it is a reciprocal effect of relative motion between the star and the Earth. Now, I contest that. I say you won't get aberration if... Uh, if the Earth is still. Now, that actually counters the, the geocentric uh, explanations. I mean, the geocentric people say, oh, that explains um, MMX, and it also explains aberration, the airy experiment. But actually, if the Earth were actually stationary and a star were moving, there'd be no necessity to tilt the telescope. It, 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 requires, it requires the Earth. And furthermore, uh, you get this um, annual, uh, annual uh, ellipse um, and you get the uh, V over C uh, in terms of radians is 20.5 arc seconds, wh where V is 30 kilometers per second, which is the, the, the speed of the Earth around the sun. Now, they talk about, oh, there's a, a daily etheric circulation, but it's, it's the annual. I mean, even, even if you say the sun uh, moves around the Earth, how come that that is actually influencing the... Um, <laughs> viewing of distant stars at different times of the year. 
what when, when the fact that most of the observations are taking place over time time lapse photos also be a reason why you're getting light from different angles which are causing your image to blur because you're not getting a representative light you're getting light that's unrepresentative of the actual object because photons that were emitted at different points in time. See, see the only reason we observe this, uh, I, I mean, the, the, there's, an, there's a daily aberration, which is very, very, very small. It's very hard to detect. Uh, there's also a secular aber aberration, which occurs maybe over thousands of years or over millions of years. But we, we, we don't know that because it, it, it occurs so slowly. The stars change in position so slowly that we don't know. But we do know over a year that a star's apparent position changes all the time. That's how we measure this aberration. I mean, if it took place over thousands of years rather than, than a year, we wouldn't know. We'd think a star was always in the one place, even right. though it may well, actually be aberrated. You both share the assumption that light travels at a constant speed through space anyway, and emitted from a position what that thing was doing, how it itself moves at a. Do, do you mean that um, that 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 the light speed uh, in the distant parts of of the universe might be quite different from what it is here? No, I, I'm trying to infer the opposite. That I the the photons they do only one relativity stuff they move the speed of light always and they always move in a straight line well uh yes with the qualification that it does depend on the refractive index of the medium or if you like the um permittivity like and permeability of the local ether Right, but I would I would argue that those are consistent variables in. in I would argue that the aberration has to ca be caused because you've changed the. See, see, I I maintain that uh, <clears throat> when the light, which is coming from a distant part of the universe, enters the uh, etheric atmosphere of the Earth, which is actually being carried. By its Earth, by by the Earth in its solar orbit around the Sun, uh, the reason um, there is an aberration rather than that there is no aberration is because the 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 ether around the Earth, which is being carried by the Earth, doesn't actually make any difference. There's still there's still a sort of a a, a remembrance, a memory by the original uh, light ray from its emitting ether because of these cancellation effects of aberration and refraction. It's exactly the same as the area experiment uh, well, if you put water in a telescope. The Hubble, the Hubble telescope is ha, is in the Earth's ether. So you're not talking about an atmospheric aberration. You're talking about an aberration caused, say, for the Hubble telescope. Well, the, the Hubble telescope may be further up. I, I'm talking about, say, a terrestrial telescope. Well, yeah, I would argue that that aberration is just caused because the light has to go through the structure of the atmosphere, and the atmosphere is obviously light. So, yes, obviously. The I mean, what I'm saying a bit graphically is if you uh, constructed um, uh, a, 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 a piece of glass, uh, say, 100 feet high, and enclosed the surface of the Earth with this glass, um, I would maintain that the, forget about telescopes or anything like that, that the aberration that we um, experience on the Earth uh, of any particular star, like uh, Gamma Draconis or something, would remain the same. It wouldn't change. Well, yeah, I guess I would, I would, be, I would agree with you just because glass diffracts light very consistently, but an atmosphere doesn't. And so that's why it creates aberration is because it, it randomly shoots photons left or right, where glass will always shoot them uh, perpendicular, you know, uh, out kind of thing. So the angles in glass refraction are very pure, 
where the angles in atmospheric <coughs> refraction are random. Yeah, although I would consider those secondary effects. I mean, I do look into having maybe uh, N or I uh, ethers, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, up to I. And I sort of summed all those and, and looked at the, um, uh, the ultimate uh, refraction and aberration effects. And I found that they all cancelled uh, throughout the way in a sort of a continuous way. And if you had dispersion, well, that was a secondary effect. Um, well, since we're on the subject of refraction and diffraction, you often have mentioned Michelson Morley and such um, subject. I, I, I've done experiments and I noticed that a plain piece of glass will um, light 50 50. So you, let's say you did put mirror, a half mirrored surface. Wouldn't that imply that the light that goes through the half mirroring, since a bunch of little tiny light that goes through is refracted, and the light that bounces off the mirror is only reflected. Therefore, its angles are pure, where the angle that, where the light that goes through will be diffracted at, at the probabilist, one of the probabilistic angles. Clearly, the light that goes through the half silvering would be spreading over distance, diverging substantially. Beams wouldn't, in that sense, all equal in that one beam is merging substantially and the other beam is not until it gets to the final stage where it goes through half silvering and it starts to diffract. So one beam ends up diffracting through the whole experiment, diverging, and the other beam is only diverged at the very end and that not identical. Well, I think this was something you were touching upon at the beginning there, um, and I wasn't quite clear what it was, and you've explained it in more detail now. But I mean, again, uh, these are sort of uh, effects that, that, that the, um, the system doesn't remain collimated, if you like, and, and you get dispersion, and all that sort of thing. And I think in the original experiment, what they actually did is they put an extra plate of glass in for yeah, the beam, which strong. hadn't that that was only to compensate for the fact that the the extra one beam went through an extra layer of glass. Yes, so, quite so. So they were only compensating for the glass effect. This diverging effect they can't compensate for. So the light is physically separating. It's coning more in the beam that goes through the half silvering on the first trip. So I'm saying that fundamentally the Michelson Morley Michael flawed in theory because the have just used a plain piece of glass. I mean, this is a simple, you know, I, I mean, I know it, it almost sounds like I'm just doing a gotcha thing here, but plain piece of glass is a perfect beam splitter. And it seems very ironic that it isn't included <laughs> in the description of a beam splitter. If you go online, you will not find a plain piece of glass ever described as a beam splitter, and yet it is. I mean, why would you put half silvering on the glass if the plain piece of glass already spits, splits the beam 50-50. Almost, uh, uh, I, I know it's it's almost, you're saying how could they overlook something so obvious, but it just, it really overlooks something quite obvious. Well, that might be the case, but here again, this isn't the only, the MMX isn't the only experiment that shows that the earth isn't moving through space. Uh, well, I'm just saying I don't think it shows anything. So, so that's my whole point is is that it's a fundamentally flawed. Well, you could deny that all experiments don't prove anything if no, they no, don't I, agree that's with not what, what I'm you doing. Think. I'm doing it in a very precise. I'm making a very precise criticism of the theory behind the experiment. I'm not saying all experiments suck. I'm saying this specific experiment has a theory behind it, and the theory is incorrect. The word beam splitter is used. The idea is to create two equal beams. I'm pointing out how the two beams aren't equal. I think that's a substantial flaw in the experiment. Well, I, I think um, <clears throat> it, it depends on the angle of incidence. I mean, you really want to get total uh, internal reflection for the beam which is um, uh, reflected because some, some of it actually would go through the glass if you didn't have a uh, um, a half-silvered um, 
surface. But I mean, the way I look at it is you're, you're, you're looking at uh, <clears throat> picking holes at the original theory, which is fine, it's field day, um, in terms of sort of an ether wind, and anyway, the experiment didn't, didn't uh, show up the ether wind that they expected. But the way I look at it is if you take one of two explanations, um, my pre preferred explanation is that the local ether uh, is carried at the surface of the Earth it, it, by the Earth in its solar orbit. And maybe when you get further up, it, it, that, that, that dis disappears. Um, that will ex totally explain the michelson mole experiment as it exists. And uh, if the Earth is totally stationary in the universe, well, that will explain it as well. So um, you're looking at maybe picking holes in the way it was analyzed first with respect to showing up um, an ether wind, which, which in any case wasn't shown up to the level that that that, that it was expected. So, so it's a bit, it's a bit. Um, well, I have a problem with the whole concept of saying that something's been proven and we can call light a wave when we haven't demonstrated with evidence any of this crap. So, I, I, my argument is is that these are fundamental experiments used to describe something as proven. I'm saying that they haven't proven light interferes with light, photons interfere with photons. There's not even a quantum mechanically consistent description really anyway. Are the photons actually splitting in half? And does half the photon go one way and half the photon go the other way? Or do they magically split in half at the very final stage of the experiment to interfere with themselves? Do the photons interfere with themselves or are they interfering with each other? If they're interfering with each other, then that's a whole new quantum mechanical theory that's completely inconsistent with quantum mechanics. So I'm just saying there's a huge amount of jargon in, in built in and assumptions built into these experiments. And I'm saying they have fundamental flaws. And when I point out those fundamental flaws, people just say, oh, who cares? <laughs> you know, yeah, but you're, you're also um, pointing out the fundamental flaws on pre um, uh, 20th century physics that have established foundational um, experiments. Yes, I, I'm. I'm it, yeah, I mean, for example, Young's experiments, you know, which established a, sort of a wave nature of light. I, I'm very wary about looking at the pho the photon is a useful model. You can say, well, you know, there are maybe particular type entities within the wave or something. Uh, that that's fine. You can say that uh, uh, just as you can say that uh, for a sound wave, you have sort of um, the atmosphere or the gas in which the sound is traveling. And the molecules of that are actually part of the compression or rarefaction. I don't mind using a photon in that sense and looking at it from a basic quantum uh, point of view. But when you start with all these paradoxes and uh, interfering with itself and then not being there and being there, and if you view it having a different result uh, from the one that would apply had you not uh, observed it and so on and so forth, I'm very uh, skeptical of that. And therefore, I, I perhaps would support your skepticism there. But I think you're being a bit too fundamental in questioning every single experiment that's ever been done. I mean, well, well, I'm only doing the ones that are foundational to the, the theory I think is fundamentally flawed. I don't I don't doubt if I stand up my chair and I jump down and I do the experiment of gravity that that's a pretty good experiment. I, you know, I didn't screw it up in any way whatsoever. I'm saying these are foundational to the existence of times relativity and quantum mechanics. They're foundational to fundamental understanding of the causes and effects, and I'm saying the two-split experiment and the Michelson interferometer are fundamentally flawed theoretical experiments, in my opinion. And they're so simple. They're very simple experiments, and they've confounded them with silly assumptions, in my opinion. Silly, in my opinion. I mean, the, look, the, the interference pattern in photons for the two-split experiment or for the single Math dictates that it be a gradual on-off pattern. And clearly, if you've done the experiment, it comes out bars, bars of light. They're not gradually going light and gradually going dark the way they should. And they do in electrons because electrons bounce off of each other. They don't hit each other. The point is, in photons, it doesn't even match their mathematics. So they always are talking about how their math is so pure and it's so perfect. It doesn't even describe the pattern correctly. Well, okay, well said. But what's even more fundamental is what Franklin is actually showing on the screen at the moment. I mean, we can read in all the textbooks, and people are being taught every day in universities and so on, that the Michelson-Morley experiment gave a null result, and, and therefore we had to introduce some 
thing like this. Now look look at that look at that sine wave there. It actually didn't give a null result. It gave a periodic daily effect, which was yeah, well, but the problem was is the effect was actually opposite of what they expected it to be. So yes, it well, it was a very small fraction of it, what it they was expected a small it to be. Effect and it was in the wrong place. So it was two defects in their observations. But again, I think the fundamental argument that why would we even assume that mag? Because it seems obvious that we know now from modern times that you can throw something in space and it doesn't slow down. So we know that the idea of ether drag would probably be incorrect and not be slowed down. There must be some mechanism that wrench will maintain its speed. So um, I think it's flawed in in theory because they just didn't understand at the time that yes, if I throw a satellite into space, I can get it all the way to Mars, you know, without an engine on it, you know, just throwing it hard enough. <laughs> you know, it won't slow down. Um, the idea of drag, I think, was a, uh, wrong to think that whatever the mechanism is, that it would drag. I don't think both. But, but, but they were testing something, and they were successful in, in that they didn't get this result that they expected. Now, I, the, the conventional view would be, yes, this led to relativity, so it was a very successful experiment. I don't agree with that, but I agree with this, that properly analyzed, this experiment does lead to the other MMX type experiments, you know, have been uh, uh, run with um, uh, uh, counter propagating uh, um, Mazars and things like that, and very ex uh, very accurate MMX experiments, and also electrical experiments like the Truton Noble experiment. Yeah, These were successful in that they showed up that the, this conventional idea was not correct, and you need to modify your views. And uh, I, I explain it in the way I, I, I talk. Um, in the form of sort of a Stokesian entrained ether, which, yeah, which well, is right. a simple, which, by the way, Michelson himself accepted. I mean, he didn't accept relativity, he accepted that. Yeah, regardless, as I pointed out, the, the experiment is fundamentally flawed, so I don't think you can prove anything with false assumptions. And the more, the more elaborate experiment they conduct, the more elaborate an experiment gets, the more assumptions that are built into the experiment, so the more likely it is to have catastrophic cause in it so I, i'm i'm sometimes find these you know if, if you're going to say that modern science now does experiments with this accelerators with you know quality and all this crap and you're saying that oh yes they're lecturing something but regardless i i just i don't uh i don't it just seems to me that you're extrapolating too much. You're finding some little effects, know, maybe, which perhaps hadn't been taken into consideration or may give rise to secondary effects. And you're throwing the whole experiment out because of that. And I, 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 I would question whether that's valid. Yeah, it's not a trivial criticism. I mean, the fundamental element of the experiment is the beam splitter. I'm pointing out how the beam splitter doesn't create two equal beams. That's a fundamental flaw in the logic of the experiment. If your beams aren't equal, you can't make assumptions about me measuring differences in outcomes if you didn't start with a control. If they're not controlled to be equal beams, your assumption is wrong. I don't quite understand what you mean that they aren't equal because, you know, I talked about the additional plate and you well, said, oh, that was just giving the well, half. The when, when one beam and then you half. said if you put in a, a non-half silver system, you'd get the same result. So what's what's wrong with the fundamental system of one going through the plate glass and the other being reflected at 45 degrees? No, it, they're both being reflected at 45 degrees. Obviously, I, I gave the whole explanation that the silvering is creating diffraction gradient, essentially. It's a diffraction grade, right? You're, you're basically sending light through little tiny holes between the mirror. Now, those are going to diffract the light just like a single slit experiment. You're going to create Newton's rings. The rings are being created in the beam splitter. They are not being created by light interfering with itself. So the whole logic of the experiment is incorrect. You're creating diverging Newton ringed light coming out of your thing you're calling a beam splitter because the beam splitter has a diffraction gradient painted on it. Well, I, I mean, I would have to disagree because, you know, the principle of the MMX was not that it produces interference rings. That was not <laughs> well, that because if you if you put that experiment in a stationary place, 
it produces interference bands. But what was what they claimed was that when you rotate the device, that if there was a flow of ether, which would cause light to have to travel further in one direction versus the other, then you would see those fringes shift. So it was the fringe shift and not the fringes itself. It's so it, but that's it, based on interference. It's based on the concept that you have uh, a constructive and destructive interference. And so, it really so wouldn't it's matter. Really dependent on on interfere on photons interfering. So don't say, tell me the experiment isn't dependent on it. It's entirely dependent on that theory. It's dependent the on that mechanics, theory, but they're looking for mechanics, shifts. Different. Without quantum mechanics, it can't work as a device. Totally dependent on the idea of photons interfering with themselves. I think if this were the case, you would just be getting random um, results all over the place. If what you say was a major factor, that the reflected ray just started introducing Newton's rings and you were getting to fraction all over the place, you, you, you wouldn't get these consistent results. Now, we have other experiments in the same area. For example, the Sanyak experiment also uses reflection uh, on uh, off mirrors uh, around the circumference of a, a spinning disk. Now. That gives perfect results. You just do a simple classical uh, analysis and you get the fringe shift and that's exactly what you'll find. Yeah. So yeah. I, I don't. I think you're exaggerating any possible effect with this. Uh, well, I've, I've uh, made the reaction. point and it's, I've gotten this reaction before. So I'm just saying that this is just typical of people who point out how there's a fundamental flaw and they'll just wash it over it to defend their own uh, um, confidence in the results or how they want to interpret those results. And I'm fundamental flaw in the theory of the experiment, and it should be considered um, that you should be obligated to trace photons through this experiment and explain to me um, where you think the interference pattern is being created. Well, I'll certainly have a further look at, at your paper or your website uh, on this matter. I, I certainly uh, don't wish to be a person who just defends uh, preconceived ideas without um, considering any new uh, analysis. Uh, it's, it's just uh, uh, I've, I've rejected most of modern physics actually from uh, looking at um, expositions, you know, and analyzing them. And I'll certainly have a look at yours. But uh, on the face of it, 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 it doesn't appear. It appears to me that you're extrapolating. You're extrapolating from very small entities uh, and, and you could actually get rid of any experiment on that basis. But I, I will have a further look uh, at, at your ideas just to see whether there's anything in them. Well, I'm just saying I don't get rid of every experiment. I mean, some experiments are interpreted correctly and described correctly. I'm pointing out how... Well, a moment ago, I, I gave word, you an example the where the result word, of the a, an electrical signal coming through a wire is received at, at a time substantially shorter, maybe hundreds of times shorter than what what it would be received in had that uh, current been going at the speed of light. Now, your answer to that was, oh, uh, that may be so, but then you get inductive effects. You, you know, okay, it's still <laughs> traveling faster than the speed of light. You know, it, it appears to me that, that you, sir, might be trying to explain things because oh, right, you, you've right. got your own ideas. An example of some of a laser beam moved across the surface of the moon. I move a laser beam across the surface of the moon and I can move it faster than the speed of light. Does that mean yeah. the beam of light went faster than the speed of light? No, it doesn't. It's clearly well. It, it meant that the 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 incidence of that did actually go faster than the speed of light. It nothing went no nothing traveled faster than the speed of light. It's well, there, there you see, you were you are accusing us maybe of having a fixed mind and not being open to new ideas. You have got that as a dogma. Uh, you're you're defending it and you're explaining away experiments. Now, I can give you many other experiments. Uh, I, I can give you the example of the um, at the time of total solar eclipse, where you 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 notice the aberration in um, uh, uh, light uh, time, but you don't uh, with regard to the time of maximum um, gravitational pull as measured in an accelerometer when the moon and the sun and the earth are exactly in a line. You, you can I think it's thirty seconds difference, so, so you can measure that. I also mentioned another thing where uh, a sky wave, which is um, being bounced off the ionosphere, 
Now, this is a classical, anybody would accept this, even the modern mainstream physics accept it, that they explain it away. That travels faster than the speed of light because the, ref the effective refractive index of the ionosphere is less than unity. Yeah, well, I mean, I can, everybody can bring up lots of experiments. I mean, there's classic experiments for entanglement. There's, there's all kinds of experiments, and they all say they prove something. And I'm, I'm saying that, you know, if you dissect these experiments, um, you can find where there's lots of assumptions. Now, I've pointed out assumptions about what the word beam splitter means. Now, you're saying that you're okay with this idea that a beam splitter can be a two prisms glued together, or a beam splitter can be a half silvered piece of, of, of glass, or a beam splitter... Well, well, I am at present, because I, I feel that they're going through exactly the same paths. Um, but, you know, the fundamental question I think we're getting to, and it, it's quite fundamental, and, and I mean, I, I'm not innocent of it. I, I, I'm sure I'm guilty of it. I'm possibly evidencing that now. But I, I would say you're guilty of it as well, sir, and we're probably all guilty of it. We're, we're maybe... <laughs> um, as bad as the mainstream that we um, attack frequently, in that we have formed ideas of our, uh, we have formed ideas um, based on maybe some experiments, and we've 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 um, we've come to some conclusions. And now anything that comes subsequent to that is defined or is interpreted in terms of our original ideas. And I think we're all doing that, and and we're we're getting at loggerheads. I mean, one of the reasons I don't participate in these um, emails. I'm sorry to say this, but is that they, they they seem to be like this, going on and on and on, different dissidents just arguing about trivial points, and you'll never you'll never convince one of the other, <clears throat> or you'll never convince the other man of of the, the the first one. We all have different levels of experience. See, I could say that I've spent um, seven years essentially analyzing the double split experiment, and uh, out now in the last couple of years, the interferometer. So I have a familiarity that's based on somebody who has done exactly what I'm sort of describing, which is find out how the thing really works. What do they think really happens? And so when you go look for those explanations, you get all kinds of different descriptions. And what I found is that it's fundamentally an optical, as you were talking before about internal reflections, internal reflections have a huge amount to do with this. But anyway, but we're all talking from different expertise. So I have uh, you know, I have some confidence in some things because I have really picked at it really hard. And so I'm going to be a little belligerent about certain things because I know it from one angle. You've seen it from another angle and you have a different. Yeah, we're stuck with this elephant problem, you know, blind men and elephants and that we have we have our own specialities and on different conclusions and it's to find a way where we can start at the very base at the very foundations find what we do agree on and try to build up from that that's why i'm trying to be i'm trying to embrace ether theory by saying look what if i gave you an ether that was made out of granular sand could you accept that that could be your ether Some way to blend our so at least we have a common starting point because that's the real problem here we don't even have common starting points you know we don't believe in the constancy of the speed of light uh, you know, so things that are just fundamental to my understanding of how it has to be are not fundamental. Well, I would certainly yours. agree that uh, that ether is a particulate medium. So, I mean, I'm looking at your, your website. I mean, there's a lot I can agree with that, you know, there's something there that fills all of space and that it's granular. I totally agree with that. I also agree with this thing that, that whatever this thing is, it has to have an orientation. So it has a polarization. I would totally agree with that. And it has to have energy in it because that's what moves the earth into the sun and that's what moves magnets into each other. It has to have Well, that I would disagree with myself. Yeah, well, where do you, so, where do you think the energy from when two magnets move into each other, where do you think? That is coming from the actual motion of the, of the electrons. See, so my alternative way of explaining these things is that uh, it, is I actually describe what you're calling a quanton, but I make it out of particles that we know about. So my stick has always been that your quantons are actually made out of positrons and electrons. So that has yeah, the property of polarization. But yet I don't have to, quote unquote, make up 
a new particle if i can make it out of things that we already know about i'm not making up a new particle i'm i'm saying that photons are more dense in the atmosphere there's a bunch of light you're not seeing not at a frequency that it's made out of something we know of it's just that it's action of the entire amount of the spectrum just as we only see a well let's just like it i'm just showing you alternative ways of explaining your basic your right. basic well, principles that we can agree on something it's just that, that you know we can totally agree that the uh, that there is an ether one because a lot of people disagree with that well, two that that ether is particulate a lot of people would disagree with that and three that whatever this particle is it's got a polarization and that magnetism depends on upon that polarization you know those things i could totally agree upon yeah i i wouldn't i would try to avoid using the word ether but yes where we would disagree is that I would say that your particle is actually a positron electron dipole. Yeah, so well, that's how I give it, it a physical an realization. It can't, it can't, it can't, can't, it can't, it moves electrons. It can't be an electron. No, I'm just, I can't accept that. And I don't accept the existence of. Why can't electrons move electrons? I mean, this, this is a, also Newtonian mechanics that this is the basic thing that we know that particle A affects particle B because it literally collides into it. So that's right, the right. And electrons that. never literally collide. That's part of my argument. Electrons always bounce off of a force. Never literally collide. They always. That's See, and that's kind of contradicts our intuitions about what particles are. For you well, to say well, that we have let's, particles, let's but they example. don't. Let's use an example <laughs> that they've already demonstrated, and frankly, in a lot of experiments. But you can use the example of the of the single slit again use electrons in that experiment you get very graduated bars you don't get hard bars you get very gradual bars light to dark and you get those is because the electrons passive way that is they bounce off each other's force hard impact that's why they create a i think there are lots of experiments that demonstrate that electrons mathematically create You're kind of cutting out on me. Is it just me who can't hear you or yeah, the well, other I people? I mean, had the problem before, so it's probably some issue. I'm using Linux, you know, and it microphone sometimes. You that it's the man trying to silence you. Yeah. <laughs> Somebody's trying to, yeah, you know, well, whatever. But I'll try to get a new mic next time. Yeah, I don't think it's a microphone. It's something like your connection is cutting out. I have a pretty good internet connection, so. Because when you cut out, it's a very clean cutout. You just drop out completely, and then you come right back in. I don't have that much trouble on YouTube, but I don't know what to fiddle with it. Well, it looks like you do have an impressive uh, set of uh, YouTube videos here. Yeah, unfortunately, yeah. It's, it's taking longer than I thought. I thought I would just unify theory, win my Nobel Prize, get it done in three months. But well, I'll tell you, that's what we're all going for, right? Okay. Can we talk about something else? Well, if you have something else to talk about, that's what we're here for. If you want to bring up a, a new topic, yeah, then... Do it um, more politely in the future. I mean, you could just say that, okay, I, I'd like to change the subject if you don't mind. Or I just did that. Oh, yeah. No, you said, like, can we talk about something else? I mean, if I did that in your conversation, I think... I mean, but I think it's interesting to always bring in uh, new and different uh, ideas. So, so we've got this new idea that we have quantons and that there's uh, uh, force bits and matter bits. So I've never heard of that before. And and, and another possible explanation for how charge well, works. Can we, change the subject. Can we please change the subject? <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Go ahead and change it. Yes, we can go ahead and change it. Now, uh, we could talk about something completely different. Uh, for example, for the upcoming conference, I'm thinking about writing a paper, which I call the currency of thought. So 
maybe I want to try and explain a little bit about that because this what this is 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 about like machine learning versus how people actually think. Right? Now that's always an interesting question. It's like when we're thinking about our physics problems. Now how do we solve how do we make logical decisions? Um, how do we solve problems on a daily basis? Like when you get up in the morning and you have to decide, what am I going to eat? You know, how do you do that? And how does that compare with, say, the uh, machine learning algorithms that we have in place that do things like uh, automatically drive our cars and stuff like that? Well, let me ask you this question, Franklin. Mm -hmm. What's the basis of uh, programming a machine? What was your question that you kind of got out there? What's the basis of programming a computer? What's the basis of programming a computer? Well, right, the basis I'm of- assuming is the basis of your argument, right? Not necessarily. I mean, a computer is a very mechanical device, which just simply goes from one state to another, and uh, we can control the state that it goes to through things that we call, you know, software. So we can make it take an input of one and two, and then make it output the state of say three. That's kind of fundamental. I know mean, that's a massive oversimplification, but that's fundamentally how computers work. But it's always been a question of how our brain works to answer questions. Computers, so, computers are programmed by programmers. So let's just forget about using that analogy in the sense that we don't make computers that self-learn without having to substantially teach them how to learn first. So, you know, it's I think it's more relevant to just look at our own evolution and understand reflexes evolved. And clearly that's all we are is a a complexification of evolved knee jerks. We're just reactionary organisms and our our reactions are habits. Uh, and habits are, are synthesized by uh, four billion years of evolution. Well, I would actually kind of disagree with that because if that were the case, then you know, there's a difference between what humans do and what almost every other animal in the natural kingdom can do. Well, that's and only because that... of language. That's that's only because of language. Uh, you know, we we acquired the ability to. You know, we sacrifice some of our sense organs. You know, we, that's why we don't. Exactly. So this this is exactly my point. See, this is why I call my paper the currency of thought. Because, you know, what is currency? So currency is the thing that we use like dollars to exchange uh, goods and services. So there has to be some, it, it serves as the medium of exchange, right? But that's what currency is. So what, I, what I'm saying is that the currency of thought is the language. And like you said, my main point would be that the reason why people can think the way that we do intelligently and we can solve very complicated problems is actually because our language. I mean, to the point that if I did not possess a language, you know, if, if I was like raised by wolves and didn't possess any kind of human language, that I actually wouldn't be able to quote unquote, think about say abstract concepts, you know, we would not be able to think about you know, what the heck relativity is or what waves are or what interference is or yeah, well, any of these. To, you wouldn't be able to play the piano either. <laughs> so, or the violin. Yes, yeah, so you, would, you, uh, wouldn't you wouldn't be able to do to. any of those things. Um, well, maybe you could play the violin because you got to kind of think about the things that, you know, we can bring animals to do. No, but that we, you couldn't play the violin. It's much too complicated. Well, it, it appears that we're getting very close, um, if we haven't arrived already, at the Turing test positivity, where <clears throat> we could com 
struct a computer which to all intents and purposes would be identical to a human being. In other words, we could lock it into a, a, a dark room and we could give it certain tests. We could ask it to play the violin or we could ask it to write or we could ask it to solve mathematical problems and we wouldn't be able to distinguish um, between it and a human being. Right, but that's just mimicking. That's just mimicking. That doesn't mean anything. You well, I mean, you bring up the point that the Turing test was supposed to be like, I don't know, like a typewriter test where you could ask it questions and fundamentally um, the thing that uh, writing back to you can respond just like a person would, which is fundamentally in language. And the question you got to wonder about is that what is consciousness and what is its purpose in uh, solving problems? So I specific. Another, I have another YouTube channel called In Mendham, where it's actually my more popular channel. And brain function the last two weeks. But um, so this is just kind of ironic that this subject came up. I would argue that it's all, it's, the reason why we're conscious is because feelings are creating value and value is what we're using to navigate through the world. And the value in our primitive state was just consumption and reproduction. And the value for more complex humans is welfare and lots of other things. But we, we are, we're made, we're essentially reward and punishment is the advantage of being able to synthesize how we're able to be rewarded or manipulated. I still think that's probably still a little bit too generic because uh, like I said a lot of other uh, lower animals are able to do those kind of things. But I let me try and give us look, you know, intelligence and consciousness are not fundamentally related in some way. I mean, intelligence is the storage of information that allows you to manipulate the world but it's not um <clears throat> you know it, it's it's not essential to consciousness obviously we were conscious human beings two million years ago when we were dumb animals we had the same brain we have now we just weren't able to use it because we didn't have language okay so you guys can see my screen here so uh... Let's, I'm going to do a demonstration. So my claim is that we actually use language in basically its raw state in order to um, in order to uh, make decisions and answer questions. So I have two statements here. So one is the car is in the garage and the statement pollute the statement, the second statement is the car is blue. And we can have another statement saying blue is a color. Now we can ask the question, what color is the car in the garage? Uh, if that was the only three, the only three statements that you know, then how do you answer the, the the fourth question, which is what color is the car in the garage? So I would assert that the way that you're doing this is that when I lay down this sentence, the car is in the garage, that is burning a a network path into your head that links every single time you use the word car, every single time you use the word garage, into your brain in making that relationship. So similarly, uh, when I say of another statement here, the car is blue, we're doing a direct tie-in between the words car here. And, so, and finally, when we say blue is a color, we're doing another tie-in here so that there is actually a connection between all three sentences now in your head. So when you're asking this, this question, what color is in the car in the garage, it's like you can imagine that there's just like a network of lines between all these sentences. So all the cars are connected, the blues are connected, the colors are connected. 
And you can imagine that it's like a network filled with uh, troughs of water. And that when you get this question coming in here, it's like pouring water into each of these slots. Now, the thing is, is that when all of these meet up, you're going to, the, the, the answer is going to be the missing part in the network here, which is going to be blue. So, so do, do you kind of see what I'm trying to get at here? It's a little bit, I mean, without actually having to draw all the lines here. Yeah, well, I would argue that it's an algorithm so that it's kind of like Google search. You put in the word results, you know, that are what your brain has already concluded is most likely to be relevant or most current. So those factors would involve so that there aren't all these direct lines aren't connected all the time. But clearly, yes, I would agree that our brain functions based on pattern recognition. So clearly it recognizes blue as a category. I mean, color as a category and recognizes blue as properties that fits into a category. So those are all the connections being made. Now you're talking more about how do we do logic and in terms of Intelligence. You know, this is this is one area which which I would have say uh, a disagreement because currently all of machine language is kind of like pattern matching. So let me try and make a, a demonstration here. Let's say um, let's say I draw this square here. Okay. Now I am going to say. I'm going to define something. I'm going to say a uh, fit on is anything that fits into that box. Okay, so size wise. Okay. So no one knows, has ever heard the term fit on uh, before. So this is something I am entirely introducing new into your brain. So, let's say I draw this thing. Okay. So the question is, is this object a fitton? Someone tell me, yes or no? Well, by properties, I would argue that it fits all of them except size. So, you know, you could majority of properties i'm looking for an answer here yes or no oh. is that a fit on well, well, well you're telling me what are you going to shoot my dog i mean what yes or no why do i have to say yes or no because well, what's your, do you mean your is your cursor uh, a fit on i just want to understand your point is the cursor mark a fit on is that what you're asking no is the big box a fit on oh <clears throat> no because it's not exactly like your little box so no well, I defined a fit on as anything that fits into that box. Oh, yeah, so will this has, box yes, okay. fit into oh, that okay. box? I get, you. I get you. Right. Okay. So you're saying that anything that fits on it based on small box obviously fits in the big box. Well, there's some catch here, but obviously no, because you've asked, does a bigger box fit into the smaller box? And the answer is no. Yes. The answer is no. So the question is, how did you do that? Given that this is the only thing this statement is the only bit that I told you about that. Well, your sentence says a fit on is anything that fits into that box. That's right. So you, I, I would, I would assert that the way you anything, did that. Anything. What is an anything? And anything that fits. It's by spatial box. comprehension. I'm saying it's what's not the, merely language. Anything would be something other than the box, right? Fit on is one thing. The anything is something else, right? A fit on is okay. How about this? How about this object I just drew here? Is that a fit on? Fits in the box. <laughs> I'm just saying, rewrite your sentence. The way your sentence is written, it says a fit on is anything that fits into that box. So if I put a bird inside of that box, it would be a fit on. Does it fit in the box? Yes, that's correct. Right, so then the little black thing fits in the box. So yes, it would be a fit on. Does it fit it inside the box? Yes. Now the way of I, that I contend that you're doing that right. is okay. that because you box. know what the words anything means, and 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 you know what the word fits means, and you know what the that and the box means, 
So when you're evaluating whether this goes in here, you're saying, does this triangle logically meet the requirements that it fits, meaning it's smaller, and it, it, it meets the requirement that it's in that box? So we are making that logical presumption, and all that logical presumption, we had to use words to do that. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm contending that a monkey would not be able to do a concept like this because they actually don't have language in order to make that kind of distinction. Now, well, I think that's what the same point I'm making is that Yes, language is fundamental as to, to us accessing our intelligence. We don't have any without it. Two million years ago, we were really dumb, and we weren't just dumb because no one, we didn't have any school teachers. We were dumb because we didn't have any way to exchange concepts. Yeah, so that's very important. So that's, that, that's I think we can totally agree on that. But this is not the only way you can solve this problem. Now, this is what I disagree with the pattern matching because this particular problem can also be done using machine learning and quote unquote neural networks in that you can give a computer this and you can say that this is a fit on, yes. And then you give another example, this fit on, this is no. And you could give it like, you know, all kinds of different examples. And you would say that that is not a fit on, but this is or this is a fit on, but, you know, well, I know but aren't you, this aren't, isn't. Aren't you arguing kind of a semantics and saying that, you know, we're just arguing about how logic is performed and clearly logic has rules, you know, non-contradiction, fundamental rules of logic. And so you're just saying, yes, computers can do logic, human beings can do logic. It doesn't mean they're doing it. The no, same. no, I believe that. See, this is pattern matching and pattern matching actually isn't logic. I think it is so. Because the way you look at how these machine learning things work is that, you know, they have this series of uh, nodes and whenever the machine sees this and you tell it it's not that, all it's doing is it's creating this network that encodes this, this, uh, this true or false, but you have to give it lots of examples. So, you know, you have to give this thing like thousands of examples and uh, pretty soon it can get pretty good at recognizing stuff. For example, you know, um, they have machine learning things that can recognize a hot dog in a picture, right? And they can get really, really good at this. And you can show it any picture, and if it's a hot dog in there, it'll say yes. And if there's not a hot dog in there, it says no. But right? isn't that just a definition of properties, right? You're just saying that you've identified 50,000 properties that a hot dog has has become educated properties. Yeah, see, this is what is known as machine learning. But I would say that, you know, while, while people are good at that same kind of pattern matching, that's not fundamentally what we use to do, say, even uh, uh, identification tasks like the, the fit on. I'm saying that the computer can do that entirely through a process of examples. But you notice that when I gave you the definition of a fit on, you could tell what whether it was or not without me even giving you, you know, even one example, right? I didn't well, have to give you I any examples. The examples I already have fifty thousand in my head of of objects and size proportions, so I already have a ton of education about that. Yeah, but you knew nothing about what a fit on was. That's an entirely new term to you. Category. It's a box. I already put it. I put as soon as you drew it, I made it a cat. I put it in a category. It's a, a box, an empty space uh, with an outside space. I already, I already defined what it was by its properties. I already pattern recognized it immediately. But you didn't recognize that because what we're recognizing here are other objects beside that initial box. The initial box is just part of my definition for what a fit on is. But my point here is that is that you can do this task one of two ways. Now, machine learning would do it by the the example counter example thing. You just feed it all bunch of examples, but you have to know uh, beforehand whether it is or isn't. 
So you give it examples. So well, this is learning by example. But versus what we did here as humans, because right now, a computer cannot do this equivalent task where you can give a computer like this definition of an identification task as a sentence. And then without having given it any examples, have it determine with precision whether it is or not part of that uh, identification category. So that's my point being that that's a very different way of doing things. Well, and that they, uh, they teach computers differently than they teach humans, and one's programmed and one's taught. So obviously, I think a computer could acquire knowledge the same way we do, but it has to go to grammar school and high school and it has to have experiences and it has to do it the same way we do it. We take an awful long time to be able to do this pattern recognition. We're very old and they still don't understand simple patterns. So, Well, I think the emphasis on pattern recognition, this is one of my points, is that that is just simply wrong. That pattern matching can get you a fair amount of ways, but it's fundamentally not the way that uh, we it's operate. All, it's, it's all we do. So that's, uh, I would argue we're mimicking machines and that's all our brain does is look for patterns. It always just looks for. No, I would fundamentally say that that is false, that that, I'd say that's very common to think that, but that it is fundamentally really why, missing why the point. Why people see Sasquatch right? behind trees all the time? It's because, you know, it's on their mind. They, they're always trying to turn everything into a human or Answer but let's let, let's look at another problem here. Like, how do we solve problems? For example, you know, here in environmentally friendly Seattle, they're requiring uh, everyone. Well, they got rid of the plastic bags, and every single time you go to the grocery store, you know, you either have to bring your bag or you have to buy a bag. So all of us people here in Seattle are faced with this problem about how do I get my groceries home, right? So how do we decide, how do we come up with our solution to that particular problem? And so I would assert that the way that we do that is that we try and come up with a series of logical statements, which are effectively sentences, such that everything evaluates as true. So for example, given this problem, you know, one of the possible solutions is that I can just carry everything in my hands, okay? So given that we need to carry groceries home from, from home, one possible solution is I can carry everything in my hand. But then there's another sentence in our brain that says you cannot carry 10 objects in your hand, which is my, which might be your typical uh, grocery run. Now, if so, that evaluates false. So you got true, true, false. That means you don't have a solution. Everything has to evaluate true. Not unless, I mean, that could be that could be true for somebody that someone who only goes to the convenience store and only picks up uh, a pack of gum, that works for them. In which case, it could be true, true, true. Problem solved. It's only when we get true, true, false. You, you think your brain goes through each scenario in this step-by-step -step way to analyze it. I would argue that it just creates imaginations of, of scenarios. It actually actually duplicates a scenario and it uh, watches it fail. It watches somebody holding too many items. You see the picture of somebody holding too many items, them. Oh, that failed. You don't really think about it. You see it fail in your, in your brain your brain runs it as a, an experiment and it watches the experiment fail. Well, that's where I would fundamentally disagree because I'm thinking this is actually the purpose of your consciousness. That it's not that you're making that picture, it's, but it's literally, can I bring everything that I need to bring from the grocery store home in my hands? If I'm thinking that's the solution. Literally, you would be, I'm saying, so this is two possible viewpoints. One is like, like you said, it's like we come up with this picture and we see ourselves trying to pick up all 10 items and we can obviously see that fails. Or it's literally, 
we were thinking, well, how am I going to bring home my eggs and my milk and my Fruit Loops and carry, try to carry those to my car? I, I can't do that. And I would say that you would actually, in your conscious mind, hear that going through your head. If we could record everything that happens in your head while you're deciding this problem, you would actually see that sentence go by. I would totally disagree. I would see the images. I would even bother with any kind of... You see, but that would be my point, because I think a lot of people, a lot of people would agree with you that because it's this idea that you're taking the function of language out of your thought and therefore the importance of your conscious oh, yeah, thought. I think you're just recognizing that many languages are visual. So uh, like hieroglyphics, for example, an East language is kind of character represents a unique concept. So you're you're visualizing concepts and in the real world. So to me, it's a perfect way to do, I mean, that's the power of our imagination is that it actually allows us to run the experiment. But I think the difference between you and me is that I believe we would run that experiment in terms of actual languages and words. I, I and we, that... We just, concepts is all we really deal with. We just conceptualize everything. So I don't think, sorry about that. I don't think there's identification of symbols, icons associated with the words, and then the X arrangement all the things that are related, lines that are connected that say this icon, a word, and okay. yes. Well, I mean, this is good because this shows the this shows the 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 actually the great and non-trivial contrast between these two ideas, and that is the point. That will be the point of my paper that language plays the central role in our intelligent thought. It's not pictures, it's not pattern matching, it's actually the manipulation of the language in our brains. Isn't that a concept though? Just, just real quick. Aren't words always just a replacement for a concept? Well, that's true. But I'm saying that when we think, we think in words. Well, we don't think, think so if I say in the word wet, pictures. Do you really think that? Do you think you see the word "wet" in your head when I say "wet," or do you see wet things in your head? You see, you see water. You see mist. You see fog. You see wet. Yes. Well, this is one thing I see. I believe happens is that every single thing that has been uh, associated with the word "wet." is actually, see, this is the kind of actual neural network that I think we have, is that when we establish, I mean, wet is just a placeholder. It's an auditory, uh, it was initially just an auditory pattern that came into our head. So we understand the W-E-T, when we, when we hear that, anytime we hear that, that triggers some node in our brain. And that, that node is connected to all the things we ever, ever experienced about the word wet. I mean, I could demonstrate that by just creating uh, let's let's just make up a new word like um, blad on. OK. OK, and I'm going to say um, I put the blad on in this box. OK, so the blad on in this box. Now, I can ask you a question. Is there a bladon in this box? Now, you don't know what bladon is. I mean, it could be anything, but I told you whatever it is, it's in this box. So I can now ask you a relevant question. Is there a bladon in here? What's the answer? I mean, I mean, you say so. I, I obviously don't see it, but yes, you say so. Yes, it's yes. The answer is I can, you can answer that question with 100% accuracy. Now that's a difficult question for a computer to do. In fact, it, but it demonstrates that, that everything you knew about a bladon 
I just stuffed into your head, right? So you know, a bladon is something I defined, and it's something in this box. No, but you well, really the only two pieces of, of information it. you know about you it. You didn't define it. So when you said bladon, my brain started going fat on, mad on, dad on. Then it said, well, maybe it's a bladder that you have outside your body, and you, know, <laughs> you know, hold your urine in it. I mean, I could make up anything. My brain automatically attempted to find a pattern that matched blad on it automatically yes. tried to pattern match yep but you didn't need, need to use any of that in order when i asked you is there a blad on in this box well i'm still protesting that question because i don't see the blad on in the box so i'm i'm only saying you told me it's in the box okay you told me you put this thing that's i don't even know what it is in a box so i'm just saying yes according to you it is in the box Yes, know. and I'm saying that the only reason why you would know that because you can assemble the two sentences together and well, make I a determination know, true or false. Sentence, you're saying a computer can't understand it's in the box. Well, of course it can understand that. So I disagree with your contention that a computer has a hard, hard time. If you tell it there's a blad on in the box, the computer goes, what do you mean? How, how do I know? You, did you say so? I mean, the computer is going to do the same thing I just did. It's no, actually, say, I don't think it would. But if you thought about this in terms of just language and in terms of just a uh, semantic network, just like we were figuring out, uh, you know, this car, the cars in the garage, the car is blue, blue is a color. You I can make. I just don't agree. We just don't agree. I think it's all concepts. And I think our brain is very visual. So I don't think it holds concepts in terms of vocabulary. It holds them in terms of actual symbols and it matches symbols and it knows that some symbols square doesn't go round pegs don't go in square holes that kind of thing it knows that kind of stuff yeah and once again it's good that you're here because that makes a very very bright contrast between our points of view i think i would i think i would agree because if you take things to the extreme a civilization with a very complex vocabulary and a very complex language um you'd think that you just think automatically that they're very more complex and, and they can share ideas more than another society that only has like three words in their whole vocabulary. And that, that it's is also probably interesting well. to note that um, primitive languages are actually in some senses more complex in their structure. I mean, they, they have all these inflections for declensions and so on, um, which say English is lost largely. And it's only uh, when we um, advance in abstract uh, thought that it becomes ne uh, unnecessary to distinguish. Like, for example, wet, you mentioned earlier. Well, originally that would just be a wet puddle, just watch that, or wet river. But wetness uh, would be would be a concept which would be quite different, and uh, you know, going towards it or taking wetness and so on would need uh, separate words and inflections. Whereas in later language, in more developed languages, it loses all these, and you just you might need a few prepositions, but um, but the concept is still there as you become more abstract. Yeah, well, so the vo vo vocabulary probably increases, but not the complexity of the language per se. I, know, I think it's all equals out, but uh, yeah, it's like Japanese, you know, they, they have much few, many fewer words, but um, obviously, like you're saying, they augment the words with visual signals. Very different things with the same word, which, you know, sounds confusing, but um, clearly, I guess they can still capture a lot of nuance because they can give that one word 50 meanings. Anyway, it does sound like an interesting topic. Okay, well, it looks like we are getting uh, towards the end of our time here. So let me see if we can't summarize here. Let me bring up the summary here. Okay, so. So uh, let's see. So is this your website, draftscience.com? Is that? Uh, no, it's draftphysics.com. Okay, draft. Yeah, I think I was getting draft. Draft science on YouTube. I think your 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 website itself is like uh, draft science, but probably you couldn't get that URL. Is that the problem? But yeah, yeah. I mean, I probably would have preferred to get draft science because that's the YouTube. Channel.
Okay, so uh, uh, great having you here today. So it was a, a little bit, uh, we, we were going uh, exploring your new theory, which has a couple different uh, new concepts here. So, the, but you, you have the uh, force bits and the uh, matter bits and you know, two opposite bits uh, fly about about at light speed. And you know, so we, we saw some uh, interesting things about, you know, um, how, uh, you know, uh, opposite charges interact. With the uh, opposite force bits. I'm sure there's a lot more you've got, you know, it seems like you've got uh, lots and lots of uh, videos. So that's uh, something we could all take a look at. Once again, all, all viewpoints are, are open here. So thanks for coming. And I, I, I'm going to have to try and get some other people to, uh, to come to the science chat here. Yeah, but we did. I, uh, yeah, I, I was kind of trying to promote the idea myself, you know, of opening more conversations. The problem is once you start getting a lot of people, then you get a lot of um, crosstalk, you know, and conversation part. But yeah. Well, I uh, find that only two or three people actually want to talk, and everyone else likes to lurk. Right? Yeah, well, <laughs> you know, you'll. <laughs> it goes the other but way. But that's my job as moderator to kind of you know, stir the pot and get people to. Uh, yeah, I'm just saying. Uh, that, what I try and do is I try and talk enough so that people start talking amongst themselves much uh, is also dangerous. Too little is no good. Too much is no good. So we talked a little bit about uh, your theory. And, uh, you know, if you ever want to do a formal presentation on, on your stuff, that, that's also welcome. Yeah, I appreciate hey. it. I don't want to dominate anything. So you tell me when a good time is, and I'll do that. Anytime's a good time. Right now, there aren't a whole lot of people uh, crashing the door to... Uh, to promote stuff so but that is one of the our goals here the cnps is to provide a forum for people to uh, promote whatever theory um they might have all right well you know, just, um I'll, I'll email you um you know maybe the next week or or two weeks all right then harry insisted we change the topic so we got this is an entirely new topic about um why well, i call it the currency of thought And so there, there's a debate, you know, uh, we have uh, very differing viewpoints. I, but I do think that it, it is the more common viewpoint that, you know, we don't think in words. <laughs> so this would be my point, you know, do, this is the main question. Do we think in words, words, right? Uh, as opposed to patterns or pictures. Well, I like the word concepts because I think it's halfway in between the two. So that's what my paper is going to try. My paper is going to try to strongly argue that we, in fact, think intimately in words, and that any time we make a significant decision, that what's actually going by, if if we could like put something that records your consciousness, that you would see all these words going by. I mean, it's it's the the thing is, is it, you could think that. These words are coming out as a result of these patterns and concepts. But I would argue that it's the actual words themselves, which are just bubbling up on the top of your neural network as the brightest things that's actually doing the thinking. So that would lead to conclusions that if you had no language, then effectively you would not be able to think, would be some of my conclusions. But uh, thank you for your, I mean, it's very interesting to have someone has that opposite um, viewpoint, because that's certainly one of the things that I have to deal with in my paper of like, how do other people really think that this happens, right? And what do they think of this particular concept? So that's very important for me to, to, uh, to think about that when I'm trying to figure about um, 
how I'm going to present this and, or how am I going to write this as a paper? I think you could argue what? that the words are essential. So you, you have a very strong argument in the sense that we know words are essential. You have to have some word, whether it's Japanese, Chinese, French, you have to have one. And if you don't have one, your brain is. Uh, yeah, I would just say we wouldn't be able to think, but I don't know. Those are things I have to think about. So I had, this is kind of a half-baked thing anyway, so that's uh, it's a good thing to bring up in science chat because I hadn't really thought about it, hadn't talked to anybody about it. So it's great that uh, we're able to get this kind of interaction. But we are actually over time, and, uh, but I think that that will do it for uh, this week's episode of the Saturday Science Chat. And... Um, Hopefully we see you all next week. Look out for uh, the announcements in the emails. Or go and look at uh, uh, the naturalphilosophy.org. I'll try and keep that updated. Um, but normally we have these every week. Now let's end doing something. So thanks, everyone. And uh, that will do it for this week's episode. Opportunity. Thanks.